Welcome to Rightly Dividing with Pastor Rob. This series of biblical lectures is brought to you by the Burneyville Baptist Church of Burneyville, Oklahoma, for the purpose of making clear and contextually uh, correct Bible studies. Make them available to everyone who would enjoy uh, studying them. And so we hope that you enjoy these lectures. If you enjoy these videos, please like this video, hit the thumbs up button that helps other people to see it and uh, subscribe to our channel and then share them with your friends. God bless and let's get ready to explore God's word. So this is our third lesson in the book of Jonah. We started with an introduction to the book of Jonah, looking back into Jonah's history in 2 Kings. Last time we looked at the city of Nineveh. And today I want to look at uh, a little different part. Today we're going to be in chapter 3, I mean chapter 1, verse 3, and we're going to look at the city of Tarshish. And I was interested in this because I, I looked at it and I said, why Tarshish? Uh, we've heard lots of teachings on the book of Jonah over the years, and I'd always kind of considered it, well, it was the opposite direction. It's uh, far away. It was the farthest place he could run to. And while all those are true, uh, I think there's a more specific reason for the city of Tarshish that we can find in Scripture. And so we're going to look today at why Tarshish. What was his motivation for going to Tarshish? What was he attempting to do? And what does Scripture say to us on this part? So today we're going to look at Tarshish, the city of Gentiles, also referred to in Scripture as the Isles of the Gentiles. So we're going to begin by reading uh, chapter 1, verse 3. And of course, these verses, we know Jonah's a very short book. We know these verses, but let's look at this. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible tells us, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, nobody's exactly sure where Tarshish sat. We believe, and most uh, Bible scholars agree, that it was on the east coast of Spain, probably in this area right here, uh, over in that part. Uh, in the Bible, it's going to refer to them as the Isles of the Gentiles, uh, uh, we're going to see a lot of references to the ships of the Gentiles. And so we believe that Tarshish was here. And we can see that's a long, long way from Damascus, which was over in this area in northeast Iraq. And so from this, we can get an idea of where Tarshish was. And it's important to note that they were a coastal city, that it was a seaport, that they commanded a lot of ships. Now, there is a lot of uh, mentions of the city of Tarshish and of Tarshish himself in Scripture, going all the way back to Genesis. There are many references. I was surprised as I began to study this. I knew that Tarshish was mentioned in a few places, but as I began to dig in and study, I was amazed at how much there is about Tarshish in our Old Testament. So I want to look at this. We're not going to look at every verse today, but I want to look at a few verses and talk to them. So the first mention we have of Tarshish is actually in Genesis chapter 10 and what we call the table of nations. And this is uh, the genealogy of Noah and the sons of Noah. And it begins to tell us the sons of Noah, uh, where the descendants of Noah settled and all of that. And so we'll begin here in Genesis chapter 10. It says, the sons of Japheth. So these are the descendants of Noah's son, Japheth. It says, Gomer and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Mesech, and Tiras. These were Japheth's sons. Then it says the sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togarmah. And it says the sons of Javan were Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and other places pronounced Chittim, and Dodani. And then it tells us by these were the isles of the Gentiles, divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their 
nations. And so generally in Bible study, we look at this, uh, these genealogies as a table of nations, and there are 70 nations, and uh, that's a whole different study that we'll look at it at a, at a different time. But it tells us here the beginning of this nation of Tarshish, uh, the city-state. And it, it tells us that these nations occupied what is called the Isles of the Gentiles, which would be the area of the Mediterranean Sea, the islands of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Greece, uh, parts of Italy, around into Europe. So the sons of Japheth originally settled these isles and then moved into the continent of Europe. And so uh, this is generally how scholars view this as we begin to look at this. Uh, it's interesting, a whole different study we look that we can go into at a different time and, and trace each of these nations and their gods and look at them in, in, in great detail. But for now, I wanted you to see this about Tarsus. And it tells us again, in fact, in First Chronicles chapter 1, we have a repeat of Genesis chapter 10. So as you're reading through your Bible, you get the first Chronicles 1-7, it's kind of one of those passages that your eyes glaze over when you're reading. But if you look at it and read it through, it's a repeat of Genesis chapter 10. And in verse 7 of that, we see again the sons of Javan were Elisha and Tarshish, Kittim and Dodanim. And so here we have the second mention of Tarshish in the Bible. And so, but it's not the only one. The, king, the, the Tarsus becomes famous in, Bible, in the Bible for their ships, for the fact that they carried merchandise all over the Mediterranean Sea. And it became very important for the kings, for uh, different nations to have trade with Tarsus. Trade with Tarsus was very important. In fact, in Second Chronicles 9, verse 21, we see here, this is speaking of Sol King Solomon and his nation. It tells us, for the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of H Huram. Every three years once came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver and ivory and apes and peacocks. So you may have read this verse when you're studying King Solomon and the riches that were pouring into Israel at that time. And it tells us that these riches were brought in through trade with Tarshish. And here it makes specific reference up here to the ships of Tarshish. And that phrase, the ships of Tarshish, is mentioned over and over in Scripture. Even in Esther, in the book of Esther, it mentions the ships of Tarshish. And in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, and there's a lot of prophecy dealing with Tarshish that we're going to look at in a minute. But here we're looking at kind of the, uh, the history and the background information for the city of Tarshish. Again, in uh, uh, Second Chronicles, in chapter 20, verses 35 through 37. In these three verses, we get an idea of the importance of the trade of Tarshish to uh, other nations. And so we begin here uh, in verse 35, and it tells us that after this did Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, join himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who did very wickedly. And he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish, and they made the ships in Ezion Geber. Then Eleazar, the son of Dodava of Mereshah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah, the Lord hath broken thy works. And the ships were broken, that they were not able to go to Tarshish. So in that phrase, we see here a time when, king, when the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel, uh, Ahaziah, had, had made a compact together to build ships to go to Tarshish for the purpose of bringing this wealth into their nations, to be able to go to Tarshish, to be able to trade with Tarshish. And so uh, at the time, uh, the, the nation of Syria and later the Assyrians kind of had locked up the sea trade with Tarshish and wealth was pouring into those nations instead of into the nation of Israel and instead of into the nation of 
in, to the nation of Judah. And so we begin to see the importance of that. In fact, later on, and we'll see this in, in the prophetic area as we study it, but we see that one of the major ports that Tarshish traded with was Tyre. And Tyre was a hotly contested city on the coast, a coastal city uh, with the nation of Israel. Uh, and Tyre was hotly contested. It was controlled by different people. Later, uh, from the Syrophoenicians, the Canaanites, later the, the Syrians, the Assyrians, the Chaldeans. Uh, it was finally in, conquered by Alexander the Great, uh, which ended the, the, the reign of Tyre as being the uh, uh, prosperous seaport there in, in the area. And here the ships of Tarshish would, would come in. So now we want to look at, and this is where we begin to see something very important. I think it really plays an important role in understanding why Jonah decided to go to Tarshish. What was so special about Tarshish that would make Jonah want to go there? Other than the fact that it was a long way away, other than the fact that it was a rich and prosperous place, but there's prophetic messages in our Bible about Tarshish, and we're going to kind of walk through them. We're not going to look at all of them, but we're going to look at a couple in the Psalms, and then we're going to kind of trace these prophecies through the book of Isaiah and look at several scriptures in Isaiah. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you would, uh, if you're aware, you can open them up and look at it, or maybe you can jot these down. We'll uh, put the, the verses that we used in the description to this video so that you can look at it and study it later as, we, as you go along. And look at this prophecy. I think it's very important. And so the first real prophecy that we see of, of, of Tarshish is actually in Psalm 72. Psalm 72, verses 10 and 11, tells us this. It says, The kings of Tarshish and of the isles, there we are again, the isles of the isles of the Gentiles, the kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. So this phrase here, all nations shall serve him, all kings shall bow down before him, is very reminiscent of the prophecies of Zechariah and of others, Joel, uh, that talk about the time when all nations will come to Jerusalem, when all nations will come and bow down before the Messiah in Jerusalem. And this was uh, in prophetic language, talking about the day of the Lord. This is in prophetic language, speaking of the salvation of Israel. And I want you to hold on to that phrase, the salvation of Israel. It's important, and it plays an important uh, role in our study here. So it begins in Psalms saying all nations will come, but it specifically mentions the nation. It specifically mentions the king of Tarshish shall come and of the isles of the Gentiles. And so uh, the, this idea of the isles of the Gentiles and of Tarshish coming to Israel, coming to Jerusalem, falling down, bringing gifts, bringing offerings, falling down before him and serving him. This is going to play an important, an important part in uh, these prophecies. Let's go now to the book of Isaiah. And uh, we're going to look at two verses in chapter 2 real fast, in Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, and in verse number 12 of Isaiah chapter 2, it tells us, The day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And now in verses 13 through 15, it's going to give examples of those who were uh, lofty, who are being brought low. And we get to verse 16, and it tells us this. It says, upon all the ships of Tarshish. The ships of Tarshish, again here is mentioned, is being included in these lofty ones that will be brought low. And they will be brought low specifically. They'll be brought low specifically in conjunction where it said the day of the Lord of hosts, that day, that great day when all nations shall gather before the mountain of God and worship him. And so this is kind of beginning the background uh, information. It's linking 
Tarsus. It's linking the isles of the Gentiles. It's linking the, 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 uh, the ships of Tarsus and this sea trade that goes on, this great wealth. It begins to link this with the bringing in of offerings, the bringing in of presents, the salvation of Israel, the downthrow of the enemies of God, the downthrow of the proud and lofty who would dare to stand against God in his holy city. And so this is kind of the, the backdrop that we see. And it begins to get a little more specific. Now, we're going to go to Isaiah 23, and I'm not going to read this entire chapter. Uh, I would encourage you to read Isaiah 23 if this is interesting you to see it. And Isaiah 23 is not specifically dealing with Tarsus, although Tarsus is mentioned several times in it. But it's really a prophecy against that seaport city of Tyre. And it's a, a prophecy against them. And Isaiah, in, in chapter 23, begins to prophesy of the downfall of Tyre, this great city. And actually, the city of Tyre used, it's not anymore, it used to sit out on a, a, a kind of a rocky outcrop island about a, a little over a mile, mile and a half off of the coast. And it was walled, it was fortified, it was considered impenetrable. And we know from history that this is where Alexander the Great, as he comes and he takes over, is finally able to conquer the city of Tyre. Uh, other people had uh, control of the mainland and uh, the Assyrians, the Syrians, uh, even uh, uh, Israel at, at certain times had control of that. But the city of Tyre itself kind of remained this independent city throughout all these times. And they had a protected harbor. They had walled cities. It was off of the coast. You couldn't march an army right up to the gates of Tyre to besiege it. And they were constantly uh, uh, fed the ships of Tyre would come there. And it talks about there that Tyre and Sidon, it mentions uh, Assyria, it mentions the Chaldeans. And in this prophecy in the book of Isaiah 23, it actually refers to uh, Tyre in verse number 10 as the daughter of Tarshish. It was the daughter of Tarshish. And so as it refers to them there, Tarshish was the source of the wealth that came in to Tyre. And the prophecy begins to tell us that as the city of Tyre is destroyed, that it is going to bring down the wealth, that it is going to bring a lot of other nations down to their knees, because that wealth will no longer be coming in. It says, how ye ships of Tarshish, in various times in, the, in this book. Alexander the Great, uh, uh, when he arrives there, he didn't want to leave Tyre on his uh, uh, in, in his flanks as he was conquering down through that area. And so he encamped there. And what he did was he had his soldiers and his workers actually build a land bridge for a mile and a half out to this island. They carried buckets and of dirt and they dumped them there into the Mediterranean Sea. And they worked tirelessly 24 hours a day they built a land bridge which stands to this day over to the island of Tyre where he could march his armies and his siege weapons over to Tyre and he was finally able to conquer Tyre and that was in the intertestamental period in the second temple period between the ending of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament when that happened and so Tyre was that city that was there and then we move over to Isaiah chapter 60, and we begin to narrow in a little more on Titus. And in verses 1 through 3, it begins giving a prophecy again of the day of the Lord. And he says, arise, shine. This is actually where that phrase in English, we, when you wake your kids up in the morning, you say, rise and shine. Well, this is where that phrase comes from. Is I, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. He says, arise and shine. For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the gross darkness of the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And then it begins giving, uh, in, in, in the next verses, uh, some of the conditions to bring about this day, the day that the Lord arises upon them and that his glory is seen upon them. And it begins to list out some of the conditions. And we get down uh, here in, in verse 3, says, The Gentiles 
shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. It begins to talk about the Gentiles coming at the day of the Lord. The Gentiles will come and they will bow down and they shall come to thy light. The kings of the Gentiles, the empires of the Gentiles shall come in and will bow down at that great day of the Lord. So we skip down now to uh, verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 60, where it says something interesting. It says, surely the isles, there's that word again, isles, surely the isles shall wait for me. And look here, it says, the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons. Now, thy sons is going to be important uh, when we get uh, a little further on into these prophecies from afar and bring their gold and their silver with them. But it, as it begins to talk here about the, the day of the Lord, this great day when the enemies of Israel will be conquered, when the salvation of Israel will be accomplished, when the nations of the earth shall come to the holy mountain, they will bring gifts, they will bring gold and silver. But it says here, the ships of Tarshish first. Okay, hold that in your minds, the ships of Tarshish first. And it goes on to say at the end of verse nine, he says, unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And so the beginning, the beginning of the salvation of Israel begins with Tarshish. It begins with Tarshish coming in. It begins with Tarshish, the children of Tarshish coming in as sons of God, the Gentiles coming, the kings of the Gentiles, the isles of the Gentiles, all of these phrases we see here in this, that they come to Israel and that this is the beginning of the day of the Lord, these Gentiles coming up. Now, some of this may seem a little familiar and we're going to look at that in a minute, but I want to look at one more prophecy in Isaiah. And uh, for a, a lot of people, this is kind of a dark prophecy. Uh, it's Isaiah chapter 66, the last uh, uh, chapter in the book of Isaiah, the last of Isaiah's prophecies. And uh, he begins here, we're going to read several verses here. We're going to begin in verse 18 and read down through verse 24. Again, all of these scripture references I will put in the descriptions to this video. If you'll click on the descriptions, you can find all of these for your own study. So let's begin here in Isaiah 66, verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts, and it shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. So we begin to see this again. But look here what it says. I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them into the nations. To where? To Tarshish, to pull and lud that draw the blow, that draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan. So where have we seen Tubal and Javan before? Well, Tubal is part of the uh, that great prophecy in Ezekiel about Gog and Magog. Well, Tubal and Javan were two of the sons of Japheth, from which the, uh, uh, the 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 nations that are called in Genesis chapter ten the Isle of the Gentiles are born. Pol and Lud are all other uh, places among these nations, but it begins here with. Tarshish. And the idea is, he said, you know what? The, the, the remnant of my nation that escapes the judgment of God in the day of the Lord, the, this remnant uh, uh, that remains in Israel faithful, he says, these I will send into the nations to Tarshish. Okay? And we see here in the next verse that he's going to send them to the isles afar off. The, that have not heard of my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. You see, the beginning of this, 
It talks about Tarsus coming in first. It talks about these nations coming in. But before these nations can come in, before the isles of the Gentiles and the kings of the Gentiles and the nations of Tubal and Mesech and Javan and Tarshish can come in, first there has to be a sending out. First there has to be a sending out of those who will go. And these go, this is to Tarshish, to the isles afar off, that go to the ones that have never heard of me, that have never seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And after declaring his glory among the Gentiles, it tells us that something is going to happen. It says that they shall bring all your brethren for an offering. Ah, your brethren. Do you remember back earlier in, in Isaiah chapter 2 when we looked at this, it talked about your sons and your brethren being brought in to Israel. And so the they here, they shall bring, these are the ones who were sent out, they shall bring all your brethren. These are the new converts to God from among the Gentiles. And it says they will bring them for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations. And they bring them on horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts and they will bring all of them in as an offering hold on to that offering idea and they will bring them to my holy mountain jerusalem saith the lord as the children of israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the lord the picture here is of these nations of tarshish the gentiles the isles of the gentiles and the kings that these had people, the, these Jews, these children of God have gone out. They've been sent out to declare the glory of God in these areas of the Gentiles. And they have brought these Gentiles, these former enemies of the nation of Israel. But now they're bringing them in as brethren. They're bringing them in as an offering. They're bringing them to the holy mountain, to Jerusalem, to the, to the very presence of God. They're bringing them in. And it says, it's like, he says, as the children of Israel bring an offering and a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. It is a, that a clean vessel means that this is an offering that will be accepted of God. It is an acceptable offering to him. That when these Gentiles are brought in, this is an acceptable offering before the Lord. And he says, I will also take of them, who of these new brethren, take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. He says, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. My grandfather was a, a preacher of the word of God, and he always taught me the phrase. He always taught me this. When you're studying the Bible, all means all, and that's all that all means. All flesh shall come to worship. And this begins, this whole day of the Lord imagery that we're seeing here of all the nations coming before God, all the nations coming to the holy mountain, to the city of Jerusalem, all nations coming and bowing and worshiping before God. And that begins. You see this great deliverance, the salvation of Israel, the, 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 the winning of the Gentile nations and the overthrow, which we're going to see here in a minute, the overthrow of the enemies of God begins with the bringing in of the Gentile nations and the bringing in of the Gentile nations begins at Tarshish first. We read that. Tarshish first. And now look what happens here. This is the very last verse of the book of Isaiah. And this is a verse that Jesus quotes three times in Mark chapter 9. And it says, And they shall go forth. Who shall go forth? All the ones that are brought in. All the ones that are there to worship the Lord. On that day, the day of the Lord. And it says, They shall go forth and look <laughs> upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, 
neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Jesus quotes this three times in Mark chapter 9, which is where he, in that famous passage where he says, if your hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better to, uh, to, to come into the kingdom of God maimed than to go into hell having two hands. And he says, for the worm dieth not, and the fire is never quenched. And he's quoting this great verse from Isaiah 66. But the idea here is, is that on that great day of the Lord, that all nations that will come in, there will be this great revival, worshiping God on His holy mountain in the city of Jerusalem, that Jerusalem will be again be the center of worship. And the prophets and the people of Israel were longing for this day. This is the salvation of Israel. And the enemies of God, those that have transgressed the word of God will be thrown down and their carcasses will burn in a place where the fire will never be quenched. So Isaiah, I mean, tells us this prophecy. Jonah knows this prophecy. So as we begin to look at the idea of why, why Tarsus? Why does he want to go to Tarsus? Well, let's keep these things in mind. But I want you to know that Jonah is not the only one in our Bible that knew of this prophecy. In fact, Paul speaks of this prophecy. Paul, in the book of Romans, kind of begins this section that we're going to look at with his famous phrase, that the desire of my heart for, the, for Israel is that it be saved. The salvation of Israel. When Paul speaks of the salvation of Israel, he's not only talking of the salvation of individual souls of Jews. He is speaking of the great day of the Lord. He's speaking of this time when all nations will come to Israel, when the enemies of God will be destroyed, and where God will be worshipped on his holy mountain. And Paul is fighting for this. We see this if we look in Romans chapter 11, uh, we're going to look here in verses 25 and 26, and we're going to look at a few passages here in the book of Romans for just a second. But Paul begins here in, in verse 25. He says, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this ministry, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, and that blindness, in part, is happened to Israel until something happens, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, and so all Israel shall be saved. See, back in chapter 10, he said, my heart's desires for Israel to be saved. And Paul here equates the fullness of the Gentiles being come in with the salvation of Israel. The fullness of the Gentiles. So many things have been written about this phrase, the fullness of Gentiles, and so many ideas. But I believe that Paul is looking back to this prophecy of Isaiah. And it begins with Tarshish. Paul goes on in, in chapter uh, 15, in verse 16, Paul says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. And look at this phrase, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So when he, Paul is carrying this ministry to the Gentiles, yes, it's about individuals. Yes, he is establishing churches. Yes, he is doing these great works. But in the back of Paul's mind, the motivation that is driving Paul to go to suffer the things that he did is ministering the gospel of God to the Gentiles. And if you remember back in Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 60, in Isaiah chapter 66, I will send them to the Gentiles. I will send them to Tarshish. I will send them to these places where they have not heard my fame and they will preach the glory of God, the gospel of God among the Gentiles. And they will bring the Gentiles in as an offering. And this will be the salvation of Israel. And Paul here says, declares that he is going to minister the gospel of God among the Gentiles. The offering, that the offering up of the Gentiles, and here it says, might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. 
That is so important. Back in Isaiah chapter 66, it says that they were brought in as an offering. And it says, as an offering of Israel brought before God in clean vessels, an acceptable sacrifice, an acceptable offering to God. This is Paul's prayer. So the, how does this equate to Tarsus? Well, if you go on to Romans chapter 15 in verse 24, in the first part of verse 24, here writing to the, the Christians there in Rome, he says, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. Into Spain. Why Spain? Spain is where Tarsus is. Now I want you to understand, Tarsus is not Tarsus. Tarsus is an agent minor in the Roman province of Cilicia. The city of Tarsus was a Roman colony where Paul was born. This is why Paul has Roman citizenship, being born in a colony of Rome in Tarsus. But this is Tarsus. And Tarsus, remember they're on the coast of Spain. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain. Paul's desire at this point in the writing of the book of Romans was to carry the gospel to Tarsus in Spain. We see this again in Romans chapter 15, in the same chapter in verse 8, 28. He says, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain, into Spain, Tarsus again. But the first part of this verse is kind of interesting. The first part of this verse is kind of interesting. He says, when therefore I have performed this. This, I believe, is speaking of a vow that Paul makes. And he says here, have sealed to them this fruit. Do you remember at the end of Paul's missionary journey where he goes into uh, Achaia and Macedonia and he has the Macedonian call. He goes to Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth. He crosses over into Ephesus there uh, across from uh, Corinth. And then he comes back to Corinth. He goes back up through Thessalonica, Philippi. And he brings this crowd of young men, Gentiles, that have been warned. In the book of Acts, chapter 18, it tells us of this. And it tells us that Paul had shaved his head for he had taken a vow. And you remember they, they as they're coming back around, we, they, they come to a city called Troas, which is there right across the strait going into the Black Sea. Uh, they're from, uh, uh, they're from, um, uh, from Philippi, from Macedonia. And they're gathered there and this has this great gathering. Luke is there and others are there. Uh, it gives us a list of ones that are from Thessalonica, that are from Corinth, that are from these different Gentile cities that Paul is one to the Lord that are now following him. And Paul makes a vow, he shaves his head, and he delivers this great sermon at Troas. It was at Troas where he delivers the sermon and he preaches all night long and the young man falls from the, from the upper story, from the window. Uh, that's at Troas. And Paul has made a vow to carry these young men back with him to Jerusalem. And they board a ship and they go and they travel and they stop in these different places. Uh, they stop there uh, in Sidon and the men from the church at Antioch come over and warn Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem. But Paul has made a vow. And here in Romans chapter 15, he declares his intention to perform this vow, to seal to them, to who? To Israel. This fruit, this fruit being these Gentiles that he has won to the Lord in the isles of the Gentiles and the Greek isles, the Mediterranean isles, these Gentiles, and he is bringing them as an offering to Jerusalem. Now we know Paul eventually goes to Rome in chains as he gets to Jerusalem. It's there he is arrested. He spends some time in Jerusalem. He spends some time in Caesarea uh, uh, there under Felix and the, the other governor and Faustus there in Caesarea. 
another colony of the of the Roman colony there in Israel, where he is put on trial and eventually sent to Rome. He doesn't, that we know of in Scripture, ever make it to Spain. So why Tarshish? Why Tarshish? We see how important it was to Paul. We see how important it is to this idea of the salvation of Israel. So back to Jonah. Jonah receives word from the Lord. The Lord says, Jonah, arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He looks at the salvation of Nineveh and says, that's a temporary solution. You see, for Jonah... Tarshish was the key to the salvation of Israel. Tarshish was the key to the salvation of Israel. If Jonah could win Tarshish and bring in the Gentiles as an offering, then he would see the enemies of God destroyed. He would see the day of the Lord begin, the salvation of Israel, and he would stand again in a united Israel upon the ramparts upon the ramparts. If he could just bring in those Gentiles as an offering, he'd see the enemies of God destroyed. He would stand on the ramparts there of Jerusalem and look out at the carcasses of the bodies of those that had been destroyed. So we get to verse number three. God says, go to Nineveh. But it says, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The second part of this verse says he went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. That makes it sound like he went down there, oh, there's, this ship's going to Tarshish, let's go. Like he hadn't made up his mind, but there's a ship going to Tarshish and he jumps on it. No, because he said in the beginning that he rose up to flee to Tarshish. It was an intentional decision on the part of Jonah to go to Tarshish. It was intentional. I'm going to go to Tarshish. I'm going to bring this in. And he goes to Joppa. He finds a ship that's going to Tarshish. He pays this fare. He goes into it and he goes with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You know, I was thinking about this in my life. We spoke about this a little bit in the last, at the ending of the last lesson in this series. But so many times we want to decide how to serve God. See, Jonah couldn't understand how that Nineveh repenting was going to save Israel. He couldn't understand how a God blessing Nineveh, you don't bless Nineveh, we need to bless Israel. And he's looking at the evil kings of Israel and the, the Baal worship going all around him. And he's looking at all of these problems and he's reading the scrolls of Isaiah and he's, he's communing with God and the heart of Jonah is for Israel to be saved. And so he decides, I am going to make this happen. I am going to force God's hand. But he was not the one that was called to go to Tarshish. He was not the one called to do that. You know, so many times we want to bring about God's plan and we decide how that best can be done. But you see, God has a plan worked out every step of the way. And before God could bring about the day of the Lord, Jonah needed to go to Nineveh. And there was a purpose in Jonah's going to Nineveh, but Jonah couldn't see that purpose. Jonah wanted to go to Tarshish. You know, so many times God calls us to do something that we don't want to do. And we decide, you know, I'm doing enough. Or this other thing that I want to do, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. 
going to Tarsus, bringing the Gentiles into the holy mountain. That was not an evil desire. It was not an evil thing. Preaching the gospel among the Gentiles, seeing them saved, seeing the kings of Tarsus come. And Jonah decides, I am God's prophet. I can bring that in. A lot of times we want to do these things that we enjoy doing. And they're good things. But occasionally it's not the thing that God has called us to do. It's not. And when you begin to wonder, why is God not blessing my ministry? Why is not God blessing the things that I want to do? Even our prayer life becomes, Lord, this is what I want to do. I want you to bless it. Lord, this is what I want to have. Lord, I want you to bless it. Instead of saying, Lord, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? Because everything that is going on in the nation of Israel is working for the furtherance of God's plan, even when it's uncomfortable and even when Jonah didn't understand it. In our nation today, in the United States of America and in other places, wherever you are that are watching these videos, there are things going on around us that we don't understand. And how can God be allowing this to happen? And we don't understand. You know what? If our nation goes in a direction that is against what we think it should be, you know what that means? That means that that is how God is furthering his plan, even if we don't understand it. That doesn't mean that we don't fight against tyranny. It doesn't mean that we don't stand against injustice. It doesn't mean that we don't stand for the word of God and vote our consciences. Of course we do those things. But whoever becomes our president is going to further God's plan. And sometimes these intermediate steps to get to the final fulfillment of God's plan are uncomfortable to us as children of God. So the question for you is, why are you going where you're going? Why did Jonah go to Tarsus? Because he wanted to bring about the salvation of his people. That's a noble, noble cause. But the problem was, it wasn't what God had called him to do. So many times we decide on a noble cause that we want to see come about, but maybe it's not what God had caused us to do. And I'll tell you, one of the ways we can know is whether or not God prospers, whether or not God prospers it. And we're going to look at that in our next lesson in the book of Jonah, which I'll probably put out in about a week. Uh, my next lesson that I put out we're going to put out uh, uh, some questions that have been asked to me about different hard portions of the Bible, and we'll do that. I thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope you learned something. I hope that I was able to present this in a way that was clear uh, to you from Scripture. And if you have any questions, put them in the comments. I'll be glad to respond to questions. And also, if you have questions about anything in the Bible, a verse you don't understand, put the question in the comments. And... I will occasionally will take uh, one of these uh, videos and we'll make it a question and answer and I will take some of the questions and I will try to answer them from God's word. If I don't know the answer, I will dig in and I will study it. And when I think I am able to, uh, I don't mind telling you there are things I don't know, but you know what? I know where to find out. I know where to find out and we will dig into it. So we're going to have a... <coughs> Uh, our lesson on Jonah, our next lesson on Jonah will probably come out early next week, and I may put out one between now and then uh, answering uh, some of the questions that I've received. So like, share, subscribe, comment, get in the comments, let, you know, let me know what you think of these videos. If, I'm, if there's something that I could improve, I certainly want to improve. I'm just learning how to do all of this. But uh, if by hitting that like button in the video, I know a lot of you are watching the videos. Some of you are subscribing, which is wonderful. But if you hit that like button, this open, that opens up the algorithm in YouTube so that other people can see this in their feeds. That somebody searches for Jonah or is searching for a Bible study, that will help them to find these videos as well. I appreciate so much your kind attention. I appreciate you being here with us today for this journey through the book of Jonah. And so until next time, God bless. Amen.